It was the early 19th century. The war with America was over. The people of Niagara had seen their land and homes destroyed by fighting armies, American, British, and native nations. Old relationships had to be mended. Homes and businesses all had to be reconstructed. Timber manufactured. Farms had to be recovered. And now, new lives had to begin. Rebuilding was the primary focus. Residents could apply for compensation for any losses they suffered due to the war. These war claims included utensils and tools, farm animals and orchards, libraries, and even medical equipment. Supplies had to be restocked, and money was in short supply. Often merchants had to act as bankers. But the Niagara River was to be as profitable in peacetime as it had been strategic during the war. Commercial traffic revived, and steamships ushered in a new era of marine prosperity. In 1831, a group of local Niagara entrepreneurs formed the Niagara Harbor and Dock Company. This was the beginning of a shipbuilding industry that would become, for a short time, the largest facility in Upper Canada. The first Welland Canal was completed in 1833. A marvel of engineering, it soon became the principal shipping route to Lake Erie. But it moved a profitable shipping trade from Niagara to St. Catharines. However, the district seat and center of law and administration remained in Niagara, but only for a while. It brought significant economic benefits. But in 1862, despite a new courthouse being built 15 years earlier, the county court was relocated to St. Catharines, closer to the Welland Canal. It was an unfortunate blow to the town's growth, but Niagara still had the river. It still had Lake Ontario, and its proximity to both gave Niagara its economic strength. From its beginnings, Niagara had been a meeting place of culture, of people and ideas, a place of refuge. Maria Rye operated her western home here for 25 years. That was the name of the home she created for thousands of destitute girls taken from the streets of England. She brought them to Niagara. The girls were trained as domestic servants or farm workers and sent to local homes. But what happened to them after that was rarely documented. Southern Ontario was also a welcoming stop along the Underground Railroad, the network of secret routes and safe houses used by escaping black slaves from the United States. Many blacks, either slaves or born free, found refuge in Niagara. They became part of the community, owning property, raising families, and some settled in what was known as the Coloured Village, south of William Street. They brought a strong faith with them too. Some belonged to various churches in town, but others helped build Niagara's first Baptist church in 1830. Both the Anglican and the Presbyterian churches had been victims of the invading forces during the war. The Anglicans were able to salvage much of St. Mark's, but the Presbyterians, they had to rebuild St. Andrew's completely. And by 1835, the growing Irish population in Niagara helped build the community's first Catholic church, St. Vincent de Paul. Niagara Town's people proved themselves well able to adapt to the tides of change and the cultural life and elegance that had characterized Niagara once again began to flourish. The 19th century was well on its way to the age of tourism. <laughs>